Good morning, sirs, ma'am, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Lovely to see you all. Um, to our, I think it's our fourth, maybe, open day. Today's quite special because we're going to fly the Wessex. We have flown the Wessex around five hours so far. So even myself, uh, test my program, which is now complete. And we had the permit issues yesterday, as many people know. It's um, been an interesting journey, to say the least. Um, and I know, I have to say this because I know in amongst the crowd now, there's CAA haters. They're totally opposite for us. We would never have done this without the CAA. They have been absolutely brilliant. Where's um, Dave and Co, Jane? The engineers. Right, okay, well, they don't come up, they don't come up. Um, as far as the engineering staff goes, and as far as the is and the CAA, the CAA couldn't do enough. And we've just been talking to the CAA now about our um, seeking. In fact, I just bought another one, so I've actually got two seeking, because we've put in the air, Mark 3 and Mark 4. Um, we spoke to them at length yesterday, and they're happy it's going to be intermediate, which is big news for us, not complex category. With, uh, and, and with the help of the CAA, with the help of Leonardo, with the help of Chris Page and MOD, we'll get this thing on the intermediate cash room. We hope to have one almost probably flying by Christmas, maybe. Which Christmas? We're not sure. <laughs> because there are, are all ex crapsies engineers. So tea comes first, but I'll just confiscate the kettle if they play up. Then that'll bring them back into line. As ever, you forget to thank somebody, right? And I'm a devil for it. Last time I forgot to thank half the people that were involved, so I'll leave a list this time. Um, I'm going to would introduce the engineers, but they're not here, so that that can be um, that can we, we can do it in a minute. But first of all, I've got to say thanks to Jane and the team, her team, Sarah, Jane, Emma, that keep cooking for us, that keep keep the crafts in their team, which is very important. Um, and introduce you. I was going to introduce Dave Rosby here, so I introduced to Steve Daniel. Steve's the chief pilot. Steve uh, is HPS and part test pilot school. He teaches test pilots. So um, we've all been learning tremendous amount of having Steve on board. John Harris is here somewhere, who is formerly the co pilot of Wessex. Can't see him, but he's here. Uh, Dave Wells is here somewhere, probably fucking out there with cabs and then his team of engineers. I don't see Roy today, Jane. Is Roy, Roy, Roy around? Roy Scriven, a good old boy who worked in Westlands all his life, electrician, been doing an amazing amount of work for us here. Um, and Rob Traherne is our quality manager. Oops. But um, Rob's responsible to make sure we do everything properly. And we do. Rob's a commander on submarines, so he, he, he does crack it. <laughs> uh, Mark Service, who's helped us put all this together, he's pretty much our secretary. He ex crab. Sergeant Crab, so he's a bitch. He's just that bitch. We <laughs> need a bitch. I'm an ex-squally. A couple of ex-lady guys, ex-crabs. We need a bitch. Uh, the Wessex. Hmm. Well, there's a bit of a story to that. I took the whirlwind in the first time I had it, the first year I had it, into Yerberton, to the air show. And um, I was up on the head fucking around, all dirty and like you did. So I love being dirty. I was mucky and uh, there's a voice down the bottom said, if you've got a minute, oh yeah, <laughs> Captain RN. So I came, I came down and smartly drew myself to attention and spoke to the chap and his name was Captain Nick Blackman. And he said to me, he said, how would you fancy getting the Wessex in the air? I thought, oh Lord, we just had all the time, effort and money on the world and now we think about Wessex. And there's not been one on, on the UK register, there's not been one privately flying on the floor. That's not actually quite true, but near enough. Uh, they hadn't been one on the UK road, so we thought, well, we'll give it a go. So Captain Nick and I spent quite a lot of time researching it. We got the Navy behind it. We got the Admirals in the Navy behind it, which I believe have Keith Blount, who without Keith Blount, I think we'd have probably floundered a little bit. But anyway, we got it. We got the aircraft. I bought them, paid for them, with an absolute truckload of spares, which are all out there on racks and containers full. We um, embarked on the, pro on the program, and we thought it would take two years. It actually took 18 months. More or less 18 months of the day it took um, to get the permit released and became a flying aircraft. So from a, a museum piece, in essence, it's become a flying aircraft, the only flying aircraft. So we're quite pleased about that. 
there was another Navy guy that was really instrumental in helping us come under, uh, Dave Neely. He's, I don't think he's here today, but I think he might come later. But he was, um, he was very helpful, always been a good friend to us, as indeed as Chris and the MOD. Terry Fowler, um, Chris, been great. We would have really struggled without that. Because there's all sorts of things that they know that we don't know. There's all sorts of things that are bits and pieces, and it's the faffiest little nappiest bit that can stop the thing from working. If you can't get it, even with 90 pallets of spares out there, guess what? The spares out there were all spares that never went wrong, which is why we got them. So there's nothing wrong with our air aircraft. Fortunately, we had um, we had TSW, the, the Sport Wing RAF, and they asked us, the RAF asking me, you know, but there we are. Could we paint their gate guarding? So we had it down here, and its nickname is Charlie Charlie because it's one Prince Charles for it apparently. We had that down here, and they said any bits you need off it, just take the bits off you need and um, put your old bits back on it. As long as it's complete, we're happy. So that was a godsend because there was lots of bits on that that we didn't have um, billeted push rods and bits and pieces, whereas with magnesium alloy, which we didn't really want. But we did, we did, we did all that. Anyway, it goes down. <coughs> there we are. Places like um, places you would never think, like the Yorkshire Preservation Group, Alan Beatty's crowd. I mean, little bits of niff and trivia that you think, but without it, we can't get the damn thing to go. So they've been really helpful. There's been an enormous amount of help with Leonardo from Leonardo Westlands. We all call it Westlands, don't we? It's still Westland now. Their call sign is actually Westland on the radio, and we still use it. So they're Westlands, as far as we're concerned. Um, the CEO, when I first thought about the project, I met him, he was at a naval dinner and um, we were chatting about one thing and he said, well look, any company you us, you just ask and I'll put a director in charge of liaising between me and you, Chaplain John Dixon. So John Dixon then drove it down the line a little bit and we had Ian Bentley, we had Ian Bentley and we had Andy Godfrey, who were our daily points of contact with Leonardo, but again, it's all these people and all these groups that have helped us to get this thing going because without Leonardo, we'd have been stuffed. Leonardo spent four months in dirty old dusty cupboards looking for information on Wessex, the latest eight pieces of it, or the latest information they've got. And they come up with loads of things. Seeking by comparison will be easy because it's still current, it still flies with other, with other forces. So getting the seeking together information will be a lot easier. But, um, Funny thing was, they had some. They had a couple of girls, and they were rooting through documents in some document store that leaked water, apparently in Westland. And they found drawings <coughs> on the wall of a Spitfire wing. Did you believe that? They actually found the draw, the blueprints of Spitfire wings. <coughs> uh, one page, two to go. We've had, um, and I hope it's been a two-way thing. Paul Cheatham over there. He's uh, he's with Bridgewater College. They have an aviation department. We have a couple of students every week. We have two different ones, except we've got one we can't get rid of. She's over there called Amber. <laughs> <laughs> Amber was um, Amber Blesser was quite quite keen. She wanted to stay here and be an apprentice with us, but Amber's been offered a, a position with Leonardo to go to, off to uni and, and become a Navy on the local Aeronautical Engineer. Aeronautical Engineer, you do? Yeah, yeah with Leonardo. So that's good. I'm pleased with that. Um, the Royal Naval Engineering School at HMS Solomon. Amazing help we've had from them. We've had all sorts of bits again, and it's it's just that I can't reiterate enough. It's the damn littlest, tiniest little bit that you can't get, and yet we've managed it. And now I think, and I was talking to Chris earlier off, I think we've got enough bits <coughs> together now that we can uh, get our second message going, which is 771, which was a fault. <coughs> I can't quite like to see that flag. So we can have a go at that. Again, uh, Chris just told me this week there's another uh, Mark V at Benson. It's, um, there was a gate guard that's been outside ages, but it's going to be written off. I reckon can buy that for the safer scrap. But there's lots of bits on that that we can use, especially electronic boxes that we can no longer get or get repaired. Uh, Navy wings. Uh, Navy wings again. Jock Alexander, Ian Tibbet were all over the whole thing with the, with the Wessex. Now. Um, we managed to get, or Steve managed to get into the ear of um, Admiral Matt Bryars. Right. Admiral Matt Bryars. Because we, were, we had our next seeking we've got, which is number 314, was stuck. 
and it had already been put aside per se for naval heritage, but it was stuck in the system somewhere and we couldn't get it out. And it needed a direct order from the Navy to the DSA to sell it to an individual, because they don't do that. And that's where we almost had a problem with the Wessex, except Admiral Keith Blackwell involved and pushed it. The Navy um, were quite reluctant to do too much. However, we were at a dinner and Steve got in his ear and said, well, you know what, he's going to put a yellow on there if you don't. And that was it. Oh, it's got to be long. Oh, no, that, oh, no, it's got to be the Royal Navy. So anyway, Matt Bryce pushed and pushed and pushed. And it turns out that the lad from the DSA who does disposals lives in Marriott, next village down. Couldn't believe that after a while. So um, again, it's a big thanks to Admiral Lee and it's a big thanks to Jock Alexander and Navy Wings in general. Last thing is, um, I was, I was, I'm ex airborne, as is Paul Tudor. Um, we're appalled, <coughs> appalled at the treatment of Soldier F, and he's not going to be the only one either. He's being made a scapegoat for political reasons. I haven't seen him even consider charging any IRA guys that Tony Blair let go. No, Soldier F. So we did a couple of mannequins, and um, the soldier in, that's depicted, he's actually got my Paris mock on. I had to take my blinking DZ flash off, which hurt, and put one power on there, which was even worse. But um, he's there. Um, anybody feels like chucking a few quid in a bucket, it's the Beaver Soldier F. It'll go, uh, it'll go through Paul, then it'll go to the Power Association, and it'll end up getting to Soldier F. Because, well, actually, we've got our president chairman, I can see you, but by hiding in the corner. <laughs> so um, that's what we've done Soldier F for. I don't think you two knew we were doing it, actually, did you? Paul did, because it's got his berry on. I got my very, but I could not bear to take off the Royal Engineers badge. So I <laughs> couldn't bear to do it. It had to stay. And I started picking, off the, picking out the sewing I put back in 1977. I thought, I can't do this. Too much. And that's bad that I have to deface my smock. Anyway, there we are. So anybody who feels like chucking some money in a bucket, Soldier F will be reminded a few times during the day because um, we've got a number of soldiers current, soldier current, and we've got plenty of ex soldiers. Um, plenty of ex-Navy, plenty of ex-RAF. So, if it's soldiers, who's next? Who is next? Could be pilots flying us around. Who's next in this witch hunt? So, there we are, enough from me. Thanks again for coming. And I don't mean that in a sarcastic army way. Thanks for coming, mate. Uh, have a nice day. We're going to fly the Wessex at one o'clock. And three o'clock, Steve. And three o'clock. Uh, anybody wants to get up close and personal, I think there'll be people to show you around later on. The hang is going to be open if it's not ready in a minute. And, um, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. and then I'll start shouting again. And please, there's five seats at the front and a throne, if anyone would like to sit in it, please do, because it'll make my job easy. Oh yes, the throne please. Come on Lee, come down here, come on. So I'll take about 20 minutes for this, if that's okay, uh, and then about 10 minutes if you wish to ask questions. Um, but really, what I'm talking about is how we went about test flying this Wessex. Uh, so the scope of what I'm going to talk about, just to prepare you, is I'll give you a, a, one slide of, of me, just so you know who's talking uh, to you and answering questions for you. Uh, I'll talk about my involvement with the project uh, and the Wessex 
return to service test plan because we had to have a fairly robust test plan for the CAA to agree to the whole thing. I'll tell you about how the test flying progressed, which in advance was well, uh, and then the question and answer session at the end if anyone has any questions. But please, if you've got any questions at any stage, just make yourself known so that you can ask the question and we can pause and ask the question at that time. So don't feel that you have to leave it till the end, please. Any time for questions is great. So I said about 20 minutes for the presentation and, and maybe 10 minutes for questions at any time. So just to let you know who I am, uh, Steve Daniels, I'm a, a retired captain in the Royal Navy, from the Royal Navy, and actually I joined the Royal Navy in 1976, probably after a lot of the servicemen in the room, uh, but within two years I completed my flying training and I flew the Wessex as a commando helicopter pilot from Yeovilton uh, from 77 to uh, 81. Um, I went to the test pilot school in America in 1981, so while I was there, uh, and just coming back from that, the Falklands happened and all my friends were down south in the Falklands. And this picture here is one of the Wessex I flew, but that was in Ascension Island and I was not involved in that. But as a test pilot, I did several tours. Uh, Boscombe Down, I've flown a lot from. I was the Australian Navy's senior test pilot in the late 80s for two years. Uh, and I flew their version of the Wessex. Uh, I was an Empire Test Pilot School instructor in the early 90s, and in fact that's where I work now. Uh, and I've been the commanding officer of the test squad and at Boscombe Down for three years in the early 2000s. I was also a CO of one of the Yeovilton squadrons in the uh, mid-90s, late 90s for three years. Uh, and I left the Navy as the director of, of flying from Boscombe Down in 2008. So my current role is as an Empire Test Pilot School Rotary Wing Helicopter Test Pilot Instructor, uh, and that has helped me in this project, very much so. Uh, I was on the very first Mark IV Sea King course um, in 1989, I think it was. Uh, no, sorry, 79. Uh, so I've got a lot of hours in both the Wessex and the Sea King. Uh, but I now fly the Augusta 109 and the Squirrel, primarily at Boston Bay. So my first involvement in this fantastic project, uh, and I have to say that when Andrew phoned me, I did say, wow, to myself, to be involved in an old helicopter returning to flight after 32 years of being on the ground is really, for me, an opportunity of a lifetime. And I don't know how many other pilots there might be in the room, I know Jim and a few others, but any older, sorry Greg, any older pilots, um, I'm sure that you would all have loved to be involved in this project. I thought it was an opportunity of a lifetime. And from Boscombe Down, where I'm surrounded by test pilots, a lot of my colleagues are fixed wing, and they go and fly with a Shuttleworth collection and warbirds all over the country. They fly hurricanes, spitfires, and the only people who fly old helicopters that I could see were the Army Air Corps. Where, there he is in the back. So Al Sparks flies now with the Army Air Corps display team, Sioux, Skeeters, the old Army helicopters. The Navy doesn't have an old helicopter display team, neither does the Air Force. So I thought this would never happen and I would never ever get the chance to be involved in something like this. So, in October, the year before last, Andrew asked a friend of mine, a guy called Charlie Brown, Greg will know Charlie, I think. Charlie Brown, who's an ex-Wessex pilot, ex-Seeking pilot with the Navy. Uh, he's a test pilot as well, test pilot instructor. He asked him to do a presentation at one of these open days. And Charlie had to test fly in China for a month at that time. So he couldn't come here, and he asked me to do it on his behalf. So I came here uh, and gave a presentation to Andrew, uh, to the, the, the audience, and Andrew's one of his first open days, uh, and it seemed to go quite well. And I thought nothing more of it. A, I thought Charlie Brown would never come back from China because they're not very safe in China, but also I thought I wouldn't hear 
again about this project. But in January of last year, which is only 18 months ago, I got a phone call from Andrew asking me if I would like to help with this project. What I thought he wanted was advice on who would be a good pilot to be involved in this project. And I gave him a list of names of people I thought would be appropriate, none of which were mine. But then he came back and he said, actually, he'd been talking to a few Navy people and he, he would like me to do it. Which was a big surprise to me, but I said, OK, I'll think about it. And I thought about it for about a nanosecond and said, yes, that's a great idea, because it has been an opportunity of a lifetime. We also got John Harrison, uh, an ex-RAF squadron leader, who's on the program as well. So he and I have been flying the aircraft. He's got more Wessex hours than I have, uh, but he doesn't have the flight test background. But between us, we have really gelled, I would say, and brought the best of both worlds into a program which has involved a lot of test flying principles but a reliance on having flown the Wessex before. So we've worked really well as a team. Uh, so in February last year, I say only 18 months ago, we started the planning for the flight testing of this helicopter. And for the first nine months, while the engineers under Dave over there were doing all their engineering, taking the aircraft apart, putting it back together again, doing everything to make her airworthy, the first nine month, months, we were liaising with the Civil Aviation Authority as to how we were going to fly this aircraft because there was no one qualified on the Wessex on the uh, civil licensing uh, program. Uh, there was no one in the CAA who was licensed to fly the Wessex. Uh, and by November of last year, we got, after nine months of trying, we got aircraft type rating exemptions for me uh, as the kind of lead pilot, the test pilot, and for John uh, to be trained for full exemptions. And that was about a week before we planned our first flight. So it, it really was lucky that the CAA gave us the approvals to fly uh, at that time. So. There is, this is not a reading test for those at the back, but what I've shown you there is just a screenshot of what we had to produce to satisfy the Civil Aviation Authority that we could test fly this helicopter. And that is uh, a recovery to flight, flight test plan that I wrote with everyone here, uh, and it was 23 pages, uh, and that involved a few things. The first thing was a test matrix. We had to work out how we were going to safely test this helicopter. Um, and for those engineers in the audience, we based it on the Wessex post-maintenance flight test schedule. Because any military helicopter in service, if it has maintenance done on it, then the maintenance test pilot would take the aircraft flying check that it was back to its normal airworthiness state and sign it off. So there is a manual which deals with every aspect of post-maintenance on the aircraft. So we based it on that and this is the matrix that we had. I say I won't go through it but basically it talks about ground testing and then rigging, uh, vibration testing, blade tracking, checking the engines, doing some general handling, checking the hydraulics, we had to do a running landing to check the undercarriage, a brake test, etc. But that, that wasn't a big deal because there's a manual for that and a schedule. So we incorporated that into that matrix. But then we had to persuade the CAA that it was safe to fly this aircraft after 32 years on the ground. Uh, and this is where my test flying background came in because I based this on the mantra which test pilots and flight test engineers have, which is you always test fly with a very cautious and progressive approach because that's the only way that you can do something like this safety, safely. And this is what I teach every single day when I'm teaching at the Empire Test Pilot School at Boston Dam. So our sortie profiles for a five hour test program 
were in accordance with this matrix, which, again, you can't read it, I know, but that was in our test program, that was in our test plan, and it involved ground runs to check the engines first. Then it involved engaged ground runs to get the rotors turning, but not even plan to leave the ground. And the first day we got those, that rotor engaged was a fantastic day here, probably more excitement than we had on the first takeoff, because all of the rotor balls were turning, and they hadn't done that for 32 years, and she didn't fall over. That was the key thing. <laughs> So we did lots of engaged ground runs, and then we did some hover checks. We came up into a hover, planned for about five minutes, and it was perfect. Thank you, Trevor. <laughs> it was perfect. The seats at the front, for those who like one, please. Five minutes, and, and she was perfect. And then we did a 10 minute hover, 15 minutes. And then the next plan was a quick flight around the local area, just getting the feel for the helicopter before we did subsequent flights of longer duration to go through the full test schedule. So that was our cautious and progressive approach to the profiles that we fly in a five hour test program to get this aircraft back in the sky to the satisfaction of the CAA. One of the things we had to do as well, you would not be surprised about, is a risk assessment. So in that test plan, was a risk assessment that we use in flight testing at Boscombe Down. Uh, and again, you won't be able to read this, but we have risks based on an intolerable risk, a high risk, a medium risk, and a low risk. And we say what the risks are, and we mitigate those risks by doing certain things. And this column is where we thought the risks started. And the risks were all medium risks and you would try and mitigate those down to low. So when we decided we were, we were gonna make lots of risk mitigation, which obviously we needed to do, you know, double check and triple check, strip it all apart, put it all back together again, check all the parts individually, use blades which we knew had been matched. That got all of the risks down to the green column at the right, which meant we thought this was a low risk trials plan. And because we're all still here, it proves that we were right because the risks were low. But we identified three risks, three main risks about getting this aircraft back into the sky. So the three key risks, the first one, oh, if you go back to please, you're revealing my, <coughs> my answers. The first two, the first risk that we thought we might have, and it should be fairly obvious to everyone, we thought the biggest risk might have been a catastrophic failure of one of the components. And you can imagine, if one of the blades fails, and those blades have been in the boxes for 32 years, uh, probably more than that if they hadn't flown the last time this aircraft flew. We had a whole road load of blades we could choose from, but we could have had a catastrophic blade failure, we could have had a catastrophic engine failure, uh, a hydraulic failure would have caused us problems. A catastrophic tail rotor failure, after all this time, could have caused an uncontrollable spin in the hover. There were lots of things that could have caused us major concern, so we put a whole load of mitigations in to minimise the risk of having a catastrophic failure, uh, including very, very detailed inspections of the main parts of the aircraft. They were all taken off, uh, inspected to the highest degree possible with a lot of help from the Navy and the Air Force uh, and Leonardo's and then everything put back together. So we mitigated that risk down to low. The second risk we thought we might have would be an uncontained fire. So we mitigated those risks and when we fly today you'll see that Andrew Whitehouse bought a fire truck so we had our own fire crews trained, and we got the Crew Kern fire chief to come here for our early ground runs and flights. So we were very concerned about an uncontained fire. Why do I say an uncontained fire when those of you who've flown the Wessex or engineered or maintained the Wessex, you will know that the engines have got fire bottles on them. So if you get an engine fire, you press the button, the engine bay is, is soaked in foam, uh, and the engine goes out. This Wessex does not yet have 
its fire bottles fitted. So that's why we were very worried about that. So we mitigated that by carrying an extinguisher in the aircraft, a big 25 kilogram extinguisher. We had a process and procedure whereby if there was a fire on the ground, the guys all knew what to do. And we're currently limiting ourselves to 2,000 feet. So if we have a fire in flight, we land quickly, the crewman gets out, fights the fire within a minute. But that's a mitigation that we've put in place because we knew it was an increased risk for this particular helicopter. And we have got the supply chain sorted out now, so the bottles and the squibs, the explosive squibs, which will fire those extinguishers, will be fitted in July. So you'll see a big fire cover today, which we'd have anyway, but we don't have that capability right now, and we didn't have it for the program. The final risk we thought we'd have, and can I just ask how many Wessex engineers are in the audience or people who've got a close association with the Wessex? Okay, there's a couple, yeah, a Dave at the back. The one thing that we as pilots and engineers, I'm sure, are worried about with the Wessex is ground resonance. Okay, yeah. Craig, you've got a story about ground resonance? Yeah, I um, had ground resonance on uh, RFA Engadi. Oh, right, did you roll over? We did. Oh. <laughs> Ground resonance. Uh, resonance. Um, pilots are always trained. If, if you get, um, normally it starts with a little bit of padding that grows, and it's, it's due to a, um, a, a sort of resonance between what the undercarriage is doing and what the rotor is doing. And if you sort of pick up on that, then you're told, you're taught, pull in full power so you break the um, undercarriage, make the ground, and then the ground resonance dissipates. Now, that's the theory. In this particular case, and I had a beeper with me. And we like to with you, yeah. We, we came, landed on AD, and got the padding, but then almost instantly, uh, normally uh, your experience tells you the ground resonance is going to sort of go up in a sort of exponential curve. But this one wasn't. It was padding and then straight in up to there. So the uh, main wheels are leaving the deck, your aircraft's doing that. And the thought going through my head was, I put in full power, I do not know where this aircraft will go. I do not have that control. I could go into FICO, straight over the side, or whatever. And so, almost instantly, let it shut down. It's the fastest I've ever shut it. <laughs> and it down. Um, we broke off one of the under, main undercarriages, and, and doing so. And we only had five blade strikes at the deck. I shut it down that quickly. So as you shut, normally shut it down, you put the rotor brake on, and it all comes to a stop nice and gently. But this was putting the rotor brake on viciously. And uh, from being in the flying condition, to stop on its side with lots of foam around it, must only have been about 20 seconds or so. Um, and I gather it was a bit noisy inside the ship as this thing was going on. Thrashing and itself a bit. Yes. And, uh, anyway, we walked away, so I think we can have a landing. Yeah, that's one landing, one takeoff, one landing. <laughs> but thank you for that. The main point is that those who've flown the Wessex will know that she is prone to ground resonance because she's got long stroke oleos, which mean that they, they sort of expand and contract as, as the aircraft starts to wobble, that's a technical term. Um, she's got big balloon tyres, so they, if they're not pressurised at the same level or if they're slightly flat, they will tend to expand and contract. And this generates this oscillation which goes divergent and the aircraft rolls over. And it's often caused by the blades not being balanced. So instead of the, the sort of blades balancing through the rotor head, they're, they're sort of, the centre of gravity of the blades is moving around and that starts the wobble. So we were very, I was very worried about ground resonance uh, and um, we didn't get it. We didn't get it because we put all these risk mitigators in place to make sure that we had a matched set of blades. We sent them to Westlands to be matched as a set. We made sure the oleos were taken off and put back and they'd been fully extended and contracted so they were working absolutely perfectly. We made sure the tyres were newish tyres and they were inflated correctly. Everything we did was to minimise that risk and mitigate against it. And we haven't seen ground resonance. Hopefully we won't see it today. What we have seen is a slight yaw, which uh, happened on one of the early flights. Uh, and normally, I've had ground resonance in the past, 
uh, on the Yeovilton dispersal and if you get it, the aircraft starts to wobble as Greg said, starts to wobble, mine started to bounce around and instead of ending up pointing that way, ended up pointing this way because she bounced across dispersal. The key thing I remember about it was all the engineers on dispersal were running away because they were expecting the aircraft to roll over, blades to come <coughs> off, blades to go flying and they might be hit. So we didn't get ground resonance, we've had a slight yaw kick, but that day our engineers were all running away in the direction that I told them to in case we got ground resonance. But those were the three risks, that was our risk assessment, and none of that happened, which is great. Hi Russ. Uh, so, can I say something? When I was <coughs> one question, sorry. When I was an apprentice, just to give you full um, confidence. Oh yeah. I was an apprentice in the blade shop, and I used to stick the pockets on the spot. Oh right. <laughs> I hope you mix the glue up. Yeah. I've had one of those pockets come off I mean, and fly, and it peeled back like a baked bean yeah. tin. Well, that's one of mine. Yeah. Oh right, it probably was. <laughs> yeah, the glue. You didn't use strong enough glue that day, but it peeled back like yeah. a baked bean tin, and, and it caused ever such a big vibration. Yeah but we shut it down very quickly when we landed on. So there's our flight test programme, that's small words for those at the back, I apologise. And again, there are some seats around, so please feel free to come in and, and grab a seat. Uh, but November and December last year, remember we started this 18 months ago, now we're only talking six months ago, we conducted several Rotors Engage ground runs. Uh, we hoped we might do our first hover just before Christmas and we didn't primarily because we had a bit of a fuel leak. Uh, so we came back after Christmas and we did some more engaged ground runs at the end of January and we did some more in early February because we weren't quite ready for the first hovers and remember I said we were taking a cautious and progressive approach we were not going to take any risks whatsoever. So we're very careful. But there, in mid-February this year, we had our first hover. And for me, on this programme, that was the most exciting part because we got a bit of a crowd. We had a bit of a crowd the previous week when we tried to hover. Um, and we wanted light winds and we got about 35 knots gusting to 40 knots. But that first hover was a great experience for all of us. Uh, and I'll show you a picture later of how much we were smiling. Second hover was a week later, and that was a, two of them were 15 minute hovers to check that everything was fine. Uh, and then being in March, we had our first up and away test flight in accordance with that matrix, that test plan that I showed you earlier. So it all went to plan. Uh, on the 22nd of March, we did some further flight testing. Uh, and on the 5th of April we did two flight tests to finish the program, to finish the matrix and to finish the post-maintenance flight test schedule and those flight tests involved a taxi test because we got nowhere here that we can taxi and check the brakes. So we went to Yeovilton and did the brake test and the taxi check there and we taxied around dispersal thinking there'd be a lot of people come out but it was their half term long weekend and we were there in the afternoon and nobody came out which is a bit disappointing for us so we went to Yeovil and used their grass runway for a fly past uh, and all the flight test people and Russ Grant's at the back there, hi Elizabeth uh, Russ and, and others came out and watched because they knew we were coming uh, so there was a little bit of an audience for that final flight test and that took us five hours and our plan was for five hours that was our plan, and we achieved it. it. It's probably the most successful flight test program in terms of you make a plan and then it actually happened. I was quite surprised, because at Boscombe Down that never happened. But it worked. So, how did the flight testing go? I'd say very well, thank you. I, I've not been involved in something that went quite as well as this flight test program. We had no catastrophic failures, there's the first risk. We had no hot starts or fires, we had no ground resonance. Uh, and the ground runs generated very few snags would be my piloting to, but we didn't find much wrong with the helicopter when we started it and flew her. The first flight 
generated only seven snow entries. Now, snow is the serial number of work that you put in your Tetlock or part 700. For the older people here, I would have said that would be the part five entries that the pilot puts in after a flight. An, an operational flight at Yeovilton for me, I might have gone flying for two or three hours, and I would come back and I might have found in the, in the old Wessex days, 10 snags that I tell the engineers about and they fix them. So for the first flight, after 32 years, to only have seven issues was absolutely amazing. And one of those issues was, uh, John Harrison commented on it because I didn't see it, the main attitude indicator, which is the part, one of the pilot's instruments on the left hand side, the co-pilot side, was a bit foggy because it was a humid day and the condensation inside caused it to just be a bit difficult to see. So that was a nothing snag really, uh, but that, that indicates how low level the problems that we found with the helicopter, first flight 32 years, unbelievable I'd say. Uh, ooh, that one. And our only major problem, which probably Dave will talk about, was we had a fuel leak uh, during the ground running phase. And actually, if the aircraft was parked as it is now, uphill, we didn't have a fuel leak. But when the wind changed and we parked at a slightly downhill, fuel came pouring out of the belly of the aircraft. Um, so it took a little while for the guys to fix that, but they did. Uh, and clearly, because we were taking no risks, we didn't fly. Nobody would fly when your aircraft pouring fuel out, but there was a little bit of pressure, but we didn't fly. Uh, even when the, the, the leak was reduced uh, to a small drip, we still didn't fly. Uh, and I'm glad we did because what had happened was the fuel had left the tank and it was just sitting in the belly of the aircraft and not dripping anymore. So that was all sorted, but that was the only problem we had on the whole program. So the result, I would say this is a very successful flight test program, probably <coughs> one of the best and most successful I've been involved in. Uh, the permit to fly, we were flying under a permit to test fly only, but that was issued yesterday. So that's why we can fly today uh, here. And the reasons for this success, I have to say, this first point is important. The owner, Andrew Whitehouse, who spoke earlier, uh, is an outstanding enthusiastic and he's very passionate and I say passionate about helicopters I can't speak about his passion for anything else but he's absolutely passionate about helicopters um, and he has very effectively planned and resourced this project now the team have, have helped plan it but he has resourced it and you cannot complete a program like this on limited resources and when I said that I was asked if I would fly in this program and I said I answered in a nanosecond yes I would that's not actually true what I did was I came down here and I looked around because the last thing that I would want to be involved in as a test pilot is a project to get an aircraft back into the air on a limited budget a shoestring budget because if you do that I'm afraid you will take shortcuts and we have not taken shortcuts here and primarily it's been because the resources that have gone into this project and the financial resources have been huge I imagine I don't know but we've had the resources to complete it properly and that is very important to us. <coughs> we've also had an outstanding, in my view as a pilot, we've got an outstanding engineering team led by Dave, who's going to talk next, but I have been hugely impressed by the engineering effort that's gone into this. Thousands of men out, 18 months of hard work, but it's been successful. We also had, you can't read this in the back, but it says, we also had a couple of pilots who arrive late, they drink coffee, they fly about a bit, they fill in some paperwork and then they go home early for tea and medals. And there's the tea and the medals which John Harrison and I drank when we came down here for that flight test programme because that's what pilots do if you talk to engineers. <laughs> so it was a team effort. It's, it's, 
of all the things, and I've just got a few slides here, because of all the things that I've done with the Wessex over the years, and I'm just going to highlight with some pictures, you can probably see where I'm going to with this comment, but I've done quite a bit with the Wessex, and i put these slides in for, to, for some of you guys to reminisce, but of all the things I've done with the Wessex, which have included flying on Yoga to Nede, fantastic experience, both with the Wessex, sorry, with the Wessex, and I, I led Yoga to Nede for three years running, with a formation of 26 aircraft behind me. Fantastic experience, great that was. I flew in the 70s, the Wessex, that's the Wessex 2, but I flew the Wessex 5 in Northern Ireland. Best flying I've ever done. Our authorisation in Northern Ireland in the 70s, Trevor at the back will be able to back me up on this, we were approved and authorised to fly everywhere at 100 feet. That is half the height of an electricity pylon. And that was over Belfast, a capital city. You can imagine me as a 20 year old thinking, this is just licensed hooliganism. I had a great time. <laughs> and that's Bestbrook Mill, if anyone, anyone here was there. That was the main base in South Armagh, which was bandit country, and we always shot out there and mortars came in. But that was a fantastic flying. Of all these things, that's a Wessex in my time with the rockets on. That's got half a rocket pod, seven rockets in there, plus a GPNG, the general purpose machine gun. We would just go around and fire rockets and shoot things. I only ever did it for practice, never shot any one. But again, 20 year old doing that, fantastic. Uh, I flew lots of times in Norway, that's an A45 aircraft, <coughs> it's a by checkerboard logo, and it's also got the H on the tail, which was for Hermes. Uh, 845 were based on Hermes when they're embarked, and 846 when I flew later, they'd have the B on the tail for bulwark. But we'd go to Norway and fly in the snow. Brilliant experience. I did two years in Australia, I flew that for the Australians, that's the Wessex 31B, a single engine Wessex like our Wessex 3. But I flew that for two years. Wonderful experience. Uh, I did trials on the Queen's flight Wessex. The cleanest aircraft I've ever flown. <coughs> I had to wipe my feet before I went up to the cockpit and I had to wipe my feet twice before I went in the cabin to check the jettison metal, the jettison mechanism on the window. Wonderful aircraft to fly. That was a Boscombe Down aircraft that I flew in the early 80s, XS482. That, until recently, was my favourite Wessex. And you can tell that's a picture from 982 because this is a brand new Austin Maxi in the background. Uh, and I flew that lots of times uh, at Boston Down. Wonderful aircraft. <coughs> There's me flying that aircraft to HMS Jupiter on a deck landing trial that we were doing with the Lynx. Uh, and so the two test pilots, we would one day fly the Wessex to put the support crew in, and then the other day we'd fly the Lynx to do the deck trial. But there's actually a bit of a younger version of me flying that Wessex in about 1983. All these things to me were hugely exciting things to do, including flying that aircraft from Bedford, that was the Bedford Wessex, and there's the ETPS Scout in the background, which I also flew a lot. But of all those things that I've done over the years, this project is the one that I am most proud of. Because we planned it properly, everyone is hugely enthusiastic about their role in it. And Amber, I've seen Amber several times here because she just keeps wanting to come back from, from uni and the, and the technical course she's doing as a volunteer, it's fantastic. So this is the one that I am most proud of. All those other things pale into insignificance for me because I've really, really enjoyed being a part of this team. And there's a picture of our initial safety brief. We spent, I think, an hour and a half round that table doing a thorough initial safety brief. There's the checks before the first engaged ground run. And if you could see the smile on my face on that picture, everybody was just hugely satisfied and happy. We conducted the first flight for 32 years. There's the picture. Uh, and we completed the flight test program. Yeah, next one. And there's the pictures which Lee took of the team celebrating. Wonderful, wonderful achievement. So, in summary, really, yes, please. 
That is my story of how we test flew the Wessex 5 that you see out there. We're going to fly this afternoon. I've run out, I've lost track of time. I might have taken a bit longer than 20 minutes. I'm sorry. I'm just <laughs> hugely enthusiastic about this program. But if there are any questions, please fire away. If there aren't, then please grab me at the later stage and uh, I'll talk to you for days about this project if you wish me to. Oh, sorry, there was a. Yeah. Ow. On, the, on your first one, how challenging was it to, to uh, go into Fall of Fry then? Well, well you're very disciplined in what you set out to do, but once you got it up there, you know, what you had to, was it the. It might have been tempting mentally yeah. to have, have done that fly, but as a test pilot, down, and we've got Russ at the back, he was also a test pilot, a yeah. good colleague of mine, you just would never do something yeah. that you've not briefed. But it was, I was thinking, this is so smooth, we could easily just do a quick circuit. And there may have been some of the team who had gone, yeah, let's just do a quick circuit. But no, it was tempting, but as I've stressed throughout, this programme, we, we've run under flight test principles rather than operational principles and it's not something that a flight test crew would ever do. Yeah, never ever do something you've not planned to do. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much for everyone. I'll, I'll hand over now to Dave, I think who's the next one, to talk about the engineering. And thank you. break for you. Nothing break. Five minutes. Just give everybody a chance to move a bit.